I get tired. How about that? Here we go. Chapter six, uh, chapter uh, 18, starting in verse 16. So, Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? What an interesting question that was. So then he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450 and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Anybody ever heard of somebody naming their child Jezebel? Yeah, we're going to find out why. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The people answered him, Not a word. And then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. Let's stop right there for just a minute. Here's what's taking place, okay? Uh, before this, in the book of 1 Kings, we see where God is preparing Elijah just for this very moment. Amen? He's preparing Elijah just for this very moment. He's trained him up. And as a matter of fact, we saw him bring Elijah from nowhere, set him before a king, and use him to strike fear into a nation. That's pretty good. God sent him through one trial after another and taught him total dependence. Not only that, but we've seen the contrast between Elijah and others who claim that they've known the Lord. We've learned much about this man, and, and all we've seen Elijah go through was in preparation for what we just read this morning. Now Elijah's getting ready. All the training, all the trials. So Elijah was now in the place where God wanted him and trained him up to be. Elijah was about to put on a show, so to speak. And God was about to show His power to the nation of Israel uh, in a way that they had no choice but to say, You are God. Amen? Now, the entire nation of Israel, with the exception of 7,000, according to 1 Kings 19, verse 18, had given themselves over to the false god of Baal. As a matter of fact, they followed uh, old King Ahab and Jezebel. As a matter of fact, the Bible says King Ahab was one of the, was the wickedest king uh, in all the world. I thought, that is quite the testimony, huh? Uh, so now we see this where this happens, and that was the testimony. And that was Ahab uh, had come along and led the nation of Israel into uh, and put an investment in to promoting the false gods of Baal. As a matter of fact, what's so interesting about this is uh, is that 7,000 remain. Just 7,000. Anybody know about how big the nation of Israel was then? A couple of millions. It's in the millions. Yeah, probably north of 2 million people. So out of 2 million people at this particular point in time, God calls out there's only 7,000 left. You ever feel that way in the world today? Christian, do you ever feel like you're the only one? Do you ever feel like you're the only one that takes a stand for Christ? Don't be fooled into thinking you're alone. Amen. Amen? God is about to do something with one man to turn that 7,000 into 2 million. And we're going to find out how. And I also want to tell you, God had not forgotten Israel. Had not forgot His investment. You've got to understand, this is the same God that led them out of Egypt. The same God that stayed with them in the wilderness, even though they thumbed their nose at Him time and time again. This was the same God that gave them the promised land, gave them the commandments, gave them the law, gave them the covenant, and they were His people and He had plans for them. So God called Elijah, this man that He had trained, that He had groomed, that He had, that he had brought up for just this point. And this was a moment when God would prove beyond all question that He is the Lord of all. Now, this event for Elijah, let's put ourselves in Elijah's shoes. Sandals. <laughs> uh, let's put ourselves in Elijah's sandals, okay? So here we are. We're talking Elijah. He's saying, Elijah, go face the king. You've got to understand, this is the most wicked king, and his wife was ten times worse than he was. That's pretty bad. That's not sexist. That's true. Amen? 
Yeah, he was the puppet, she was the puppet master, right? So anyway, hey, wake up, y'all awake this morning? Man, I drove 13 hours to get here so I could preach. Wake up! So it was time for, for Elijah to now, he's going on and took great faith, great courage, but God had adequately prepared him for that task. And I want to tell you, whatever God calls you to do, He prepares you to do. Amen? Amen? If He calls you, He prepares you. And I, I'm, I'm here to say, you know, Elijah is about to show who he was rumored to be. Right? Everybody had heard the rumors about Elijah. Ooh, he's this. Ooh, he's that. Ooh, right? He's a, yeah. So here's the He's about to put on a show, and what a show it was. Amen? Well, the passage that we read does have a lot for us as a church. We live in a day of, of half-hearted service. When people serve gods of materialism, recreation, pleasure, and more than they serve the God of heaven. Friends, I'm not just talking about the world. I'm talking about how that has invaded the church. Amen? That has invaded the church today. And as a matter of fact, God wants us to know today that He is still God. He has not forgotten His investment in you or in His church. He made that investment in us. He's called us back like He did to Israel. And He wants to call His people back today. That is you and I. He wants to call us back today. And I believe the truth in this passage will help us to understand that. It will help us to know and understand how God is calling us back and what He expects of us as a church. So we're going to notice those truths in the message today. It's showtime or what a show. Amen? What a show. Here we go. Number one. The challenge is extended. Obadiah comes up and says, there's a man, there's a man called Elijah and Elijah's going to pay you a visit. And Elijah paid Elijah. Pay, Elijah. It's like a Disney character or something, isn't it? Elijah comes, right? So Elijah comes and uh, he starts, to he meets Ahab for the very first time. So letter A there is he now issues uh, a challenge to the potentate. <laughs> he challenges the potentate. The meeting between Elijah and Ahab is pretty much, is very interesting. Everybody ever studied that? Everybody ever watched how that went on? Ahab is the king of Israel, and he's chosen to lead the people of God away into the worship of Baal. As a matter of fact, Elijah knows nothing of compromise. <laughs> he's totally sold out to the will of God. And we're about to meet the, the ever-compromising with the never-compromising. We're going to find out how that's going to happen. So now we, we look and we see some that wonder why Ahab would even allow Elijah to live at this point. You know, Elijah is the one who pronounced the drought that nearly destroyed Israel in the first place. So it makes you wonder, why didn't Ahab just have him knocked off? matter of fact, he didn't mind having people killed. As a matter of fact, saw a little garden he liked one time. And he says, I want that garden. And who was the owner? Anybody remember the owner? Yeah, huh? Naboth, he said, not for sale. God says, not to sell. Ahab says, I have a cure for that. Naboth, gone. <laughs> Kind of like, never mind, I better not say that. I was about to get political. All right, anyway, I be <laughs> sorry. You know, Elijah pronounced that drought. So why not just kill him and be finished? Because I believe Ahab has come to believe that the drought is not going to end unless Elijah prays for it too. So he has to indulge this man that he despises deeply. Well, little, little number one there, here's the confrontation that took place. There is a confrontation that took place. So in verse 17, we see when Ahab sees Elijah, he says, are you the one troubling Israel? You're the one. You're making a mess. The word refers to somebody who stirs something up or causes a disturbance. In today's vernacular, <laughs> there's a disturbance in the force, right? So there you go. But it also carries the meaning of a snake or a serpent. Okay? And as a matter of fact, it's the equivalent of Ahab calling Elijah a snake in the grass. You're just a snake in the grass. 
you're causing all kinds of trouble in here. You know what's so funny? Is that they, they accuse Christians of causing trouble, but they, Christians are just trying to do what's right. Amen? Amen. Now, Ahab failed to realize um, that uh, it was Elijah that was the best friend that Israel had. Not Ahab. As a matter of fact, uh, it's that way with the, with, with, uh, the man of God. You know, people get mad when the truth is preached from the pulpit. It, it's kind of funny. It, it, it's awful how we react sometimes when the truth is given. Um, and, and we talked about it a little bit in Sunday school today. It's, it's kind of funny. We talked about it and said, yeah, when a pastor sometimes to step on toes, I, and I just made some general statements. And it's not, of course, everybody. But it's kind of funny to watch people as they leave the room, Right? You know that it might have touched them in some way um, is that they're the quickest to leave. They get out in a hurry, right? When normally they'll stay and say, good preaching, preacher. <laughs> so here's what I have determined over all these years of being a preacher. Ready? When somebody says, good preaching, preacher. In other words, I am so glad that I didn't get hit today, right? <laughs> and then everybody else comes, oh, good, good to meet you, preacher. In other words, that's like, I hate you for preaching that, but I needed that, right? And so that's, that's, that's what I see. But people, listen, I do not preach the truth. I do not preach the truth and tell you the truth because I'm angry at you or because I hate you or dislike you. It is quite the opposite. I preach the truth because I love you and I desire for God's best in your life. And God desires His best in your life. That's why we get confronted with the truth. And the problem is, in these United States of America, they wouldn't know the truth if it came up and bit them on the nose. We've got so many wishy-washy, watered-down, preaching kind of people out there, it's amazing that anybody knows anything about Christ. And really and truly, they don't. You see, the truth... According to John 8, 32 says, the truth has the ability to set you free. And people, we would do well to receive the message of God and deal with it personally. The man who looks at you and knows you've done wrong, but says everything's going to be alright, is not your friend. Mm -hmm. Not a one iota. Little number two, there's a condemnation that takes place. Verse 18. Elijah's response to the accusation says, uh, you know, Ahab, I'm, uh, I'm here to tell you. And I can kind of see this. I think Ahab, I think uh, Elijah looked Ahab square in the eye. I don't think this was a, well, well, I think he was, I think he was courageous. I think he had all the intestinal fortitude that God would give him. And he looked him straight in the eye and says, it's not me, it's you. And the reason it's you is because you are the one that has led Israel away from God. Why is it though I believe, why do people forget there's a price on sin? I often wonder that. When we make wrong choices in our lives and we wander away from God, why are we surprised when He chastens us? I was listening on the way back uh, from wherever it was we drove from yesterday. I was in the middle of the state of Florida listening to a radio station. And it was the Florida State University of Louisville football game. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so as I was listening to that, he said, uh, the, the, the announcer towards the end says, that was a good old woodshed whooping. I said, wow, that was pretty funny, right? You ever had a good old woodshed whooping from the Lord? Yeah. You ever get a woodshed whooping from your mom? Well, listen, you have to be you have to be my age or older. To, you know, yeah, yeah. Dr. Spock might have gotten to some of the kids, you know, some of the parents. But anyway, here we go. Anybody ever had a really woodshed whooping? Yeah, I'm not saying you had to go to the woodshed, but you sure would have enjoyed the trip out, right? It'd give you time to cool off on the way back. But anyway, you have a good old woodshed whooping. And the next thing you do is you look at it with all you say, I hate you, right? I mean, you just... Why? As a kid, you thought your parents just, just loved to beat you, right? Now, I love to beat my children, but that's a different story. 
And so we, we think that. And the thing is, is we know now that we've grown up and when we have to apply the, uh, well, we have to apply some learning to the seat of, to the seat of uh, understanding, right? And when we do that, we know it's out of love because we desire for them to go the right way. And that's God. But we get mad when, it, when we get chastised by our, by, our, our, uh, by our parents or especially by God. But there's always been and there always will be a price for sin. You will never get away with it. Never. By the way, teenagers, young people, even when you think you've gotten away with it, you've not. I'm here to tell you, your mama and your daddy know exactly what's taking place. You say, Brother God, no, they don't. It's not every hill you want to you fight on, right? They know. Just know that they know. Were they spying on me? I'm here to tell you, God has given mamas some sort of a unique ability to know everything. <laughs> and then they tell dad. Right? You ever wondered that? All of a sudden, mom and dad come up to you to talk about something you thought you got away with. Right? And the next thing you know, it's like, I don't know what it is. Panic strickens you all of a sudden. Yeah. That's how God is. See, God knows it all. You can try to run away and hide it, but He knows it. All right. So the condemnation. So, so Elijah goes, says, it's you. Here's next. Here's a challenge. Elijah issues a command uh, to Ahab to send for the people of Israel. He also said, give me the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of, of Asherah, which was the female consort of Baal. So you have, uh, you have Baal, but then you have Asherah. Okay? That was kind of the girly Baal. <laughs> All right? So uh, now Elijah points out the fact that the king of Israel is even using his own resources. Look at verse 19. The king of Israel is even using this. It says, Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, the prophets uh, of the groves, 400, listen, which eat at Jezebel's table. So you know what he was doing? Uh, he was giving the resources to the false prophets to keep them going. Called him out. So Elijah is challenging the false prophets to a duel. Now Ahab accepts the challenge and goes to round up the participants, right? It appears that the prophets of, of Asherah did not make the trip to Mount Carmel. Um, did you ever notice that? They, they never made the trip. Doesn't seem like anyway, right? We're going to find out why that is. Now Elijah, uh, by the way, spoke eight times during this event. Okay, Elijah spoke eight times during this event, and every time he spoke, it was a command. Did y'all ever notice that? When he is speaking, every time Elijah speaks, it's a command. It's not a, oh, shucks, I, I think we ought to do this. No, it was a command. He was telling the king what to go do, and you want to know something? The king went and did it. Somebody says, again, why didn't somebody just kill him and shut him up? Because I, I, I am telling you, according to Isaiah 54, 17, look it up later, I believe that when you are in the will of God, you're invincible until God says you're done. God puts that armor around you and won't nothing be able to get you. Well, then Elijah challenges the people. So now it's on to the people. Verse 21, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. The peaceful? Pe <laughs> Trying to get off of island speech, apparently. But the, <laughs> and the people said nothing. They, not a word. Um, so the people came, they heeded the call of Elijah, they gathered themselves, top of Mount Carmel, big mountain near the Mediterranean Sea, had a large top, and uh, it, was, it was able for a, a large group of people to be able to assemble, to be able to see what was going on. Everybody got me? Everybody with me? Now, once they're there, Elijah ignores the prophets of Baal and turns his attention to the people of Israel. He didn't say anything to the prophets of Baal. Right? By the way, it wouldn't have done him any good. They would have never believed him. 
at that point, right? So he turns to the people of Israel and he asks them a question. Here's a question. I got a question for you. He says this. He says, how long are you going to waver? How long are you going to vacillate, uh, uh, vacillate between two ways of life? These people were guilty of holding on to God here in the world here. You see that in churches today. I've been guilty of it in the past. If you've been a Christian long enough, we've all at one time, I'm sure, been guilty of that. There's one thing in the world maybe we have difficulty turning loose of. Amen? But we really love God. Or we say we do. The words how long indicate that this has been going on for quite a while. And so it is, I believe, in the church. People want assurance that they're saved and a member of the church, but they want to hold on to their sin as well. They don't want to give up anything, but they want the assurance that they're going to go to heaven one day. You can't have both. You can't have it both ways. Friends, it's never going to work. Friends, we might as well come to understand that divided allegiance is as wicked as really open idolatry. Anybody know the motto, the state motto of Kentucky? If you're from there, don't answer. Anybody know the motto? It's on their state flag. I had to learn this a way long time ago. Surprised I remember it. <laughs> uh, you ready? United we stand, divided we fall. And that's the way it is in the kingdom of God. Amen? We are united in the will of God, following after the things of God, we'll be able to stand. But when we decide that we want to have this and have this, have our cake and eat it too, so to speak, we're going to fall. We're going to have problems. We always do. You know, somebody said it's a famous phrase. Everybody says, well, the government always messes things up. Right? You want to know why? Because the government don't have God in it. Government is run by people. And that, that ought to tell you right there, right? Trouble if we're not careful. Friends, you can't occupy the middle of the road. Matthew uh, chapter 12, verse 30 says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So the question is this, friends, where do you stand? Where do we stand on Christ? So now that brings us to that little number two down there. We have a quandary that we have to figure out now, don't we? He has presented Israel with a quandary. Elijah presents them with a problem. He tells them, listen, you are being contradictory. You cannot have God and Baal at the same time. Same for us, friends. We can't have God and the world at the same time. It contradicts they contradict each other. Elijah is saying, you need to decide right here, right now. Choose who you will follow. You must. <clears throat> and we all face that challenge this morning. We cannot have it both ways. Who will you serve? Who will you give your resources to? Who will you give it all to? Because I'm here to tell you, I was out on a really nice ship called the Norwegian Escape. That ship is all of one year old. They just put it out to sea. I almost said pasture. Put it out to sea a year ago. Alright? But you know what's going on with that boat? It's already showing signs of deterioration. You say, well, how do you know? Because in the crevices, you know, a little rust comes out. Now, I know they have paint to help stop it. Don't get me wrong. I understand. I know all the chemistry of the paint and all that they do on that, right? But every time you get off the ship, anybody ever watch the crewmen, what they do? Or crew women? <laughs> Usually it's crewmen, right? They, they scrub the side of the ship. Why? Because if they don't, it's going to eat the ship away. What? The salt water. Right? I'm here to tell you, you can buy the biggest, best yacht, and there's somebody next to you are going to have a bigger, better yacht. You can buy the biggest and best. You can buy, I swore, have mercy. Saw somebody, whoa, they always try to get you to go to the diamond store. I said, my soul, whoa, woman spent $4,000 on her ring. Oh. 
Man, I only spent 40 cents on my wife, and that's only because I couldn't get it out of the, right, out of the, out of the uh, candy machine in time. But even that's going to go away. You know that's not going to be hers once, she's, once she dies? Listen, I'm not saying it's bad to have jewelry, bad to have bling bling and all this, that, and the other, but I'm here to say, are you here to serve the bling bling or are you here to serve Almighty God? Amen. you got to make a choice. You know, there's a lot of people too, though. Well, number three, there's a quietness that took place. Quiet, it got quiet. Kind of like now. <laughs> it got quiet, right? So Elijah extends the challenge and they say nothing. I believe it's because they're cowards and they prove it by trying to stay in the middle of the road. Do you notice that? You know, they're not going to say, okay, Elijah, we're going with you. Okay, Baal, we're going. In other words, Good speech, man. Good. Yeah, good. Right? Yeah. But there's times when we have to have a, back, a backbone and stand for Christ. Amen? And you know, there's times when we can walk in the middle and be okay. But there are times that demand we stand and have a backbone. I'm here to tell you, and they can call me and threaten me if they want to. Hello. But I, I won't shop at Target anymore. Amen. Somebody says, well, they got great deals. They got great deals somewhere else. I'm here to tell you, I am not going to invest my money the best I can. And I try not to spend on things. And I know when there's a, people, come, oh, there's a whole group of people going to come back, well, don't you use this and use this and use this and use this. I'm here to tell you, if I find alternatives and I find out they are directly, uh, you know, going, and if they're putting children and women in danger, you better believe I'm not going to. Amen. And if I'm doing it and I don't know it, somebody tell me and I'll quit. But I know that one. I'm here to tell you, when's the last time we took a stand? Remember Hill Street Blues that came out? Anybody remember that show, Hill Street Blues? What was so controversial about that? It was controversial because that's the first time on network television they were showing nudity. Matter of fact, many of the, many of the local stations uh, didn't decided not to show it, but then they were pressured to show it. And next thing you know, look what we got now. Because we didn't take the right stand. We must take the stands that need to be taken. And friends, if you're if you just think maintaining a low profile and trouble and sin is going to go away, you are deceiving yourself. I want to tell you, life will present you with many opportunities to shut up. Amen? Look in the world. They tell you to shut up. You don't like the way we're doing things? You shut up. You do it our way or else. Anybody hear that in the world today? Yeah. But more often, I believe faith presents us with opportunities to stand up. But they'll hate me. They already do. Whoever they are, right? Take the right stands, but I want to tell you, take them in love. Take them with a, an attitude of reconciliation as ones to win for Christ and not to shun. Do you understand that? I, do, I, I, I mentioned Target earlier, the reason I do this, so what's, one, what's one person? I don't know. But here's the thing, if one person turns into 10 million, it'll make a difference. And it'll put the right kind of pressure in the right places. By the way, their sales are... Amen? Elijah challenges the prophet. So before Elijah finishes in verses 22 through 24, here's what he says. He says, presents them a challenge. He calls on them to put their faith in their God on the line. He says, it's time to put up or shut up. That's what he's saying, right? So now we see the teams. The 400, or the 850 prophets of Baal and his woman, right? Against Almighty God, right? With Elijah as his spokesperson. So now, we see the teams. I want to say, talk about faith. Did you see anywhere in this Bible, or in these verses, where anybody stood with Him? Whew. I want to know where the Elijahs are who are going to take the stand against everyone, if need be, so they can stand with God. That's what I mean. 
Right? That's what I mean when I say you have to choose sides. We stand to God. If we stand with God, we're never alone. Well, let's keep going. There's the terms Elijah put out. Elijah put the terms out. We read it already. He says, all right, fellas, you make you an offering. Uh, don't put any fire under it. And uh, I'll make an offering and not put any fire under it. Easy enough. Well, here's the problem, though. In those days, the prophets of Baal would do a little trickery. And what they would do is they would, they would cut out a little tunnel underneath the altar. And it would be essentially like us putting a gas line... Uh, in underneath and turning it on, right? And so the flame would come up at the right moment. So that's exactly what they would do. They would fool people by, by, by putting a flame under it. And Elijah knew about all that trickery. And he says, no, 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 right? He says, one-on-one, -on -one, just like this. Now, it's also interesting. Uh, that we, does anybody know where the word bonfire comes from? Uh, Bale fire. B-A-E-L-F-Y-R. It came from an old Saxon word called balefire. Kind of interesting, huh? How many of y'all knew that? See, you learned something at church today. Now, Satan, by the way, would have given them fire if he had been permitted to. Amen? Job chapter 1, right? Verses 9 through 12. God only allows. See, God still has, he, he still got his thumb on Satan. Yes. Amen? Amen? Well, then there's the tragedy. See, the whole tragedy lies in the fact that the people are even willing to consider that Baal is real. That's the tragedy that we see here. After all the things that God had done for them, the nation of Israel, how could they stoop to this place to consider a God that is essentially everywhere? Rain, dirt, He's everywhere, right? Imagine expecting God to prove Himself to them after He had already done that for them as a nation over and over and over again. But yet we still stay, we still have that, even today, in our United States. And before we come down too harshly on the children of Israel, isn't that the same thing that we do here? We are expecting God to show out. I want to tell you where God shows out is right here. Right in your heart. Because the Bible says He starts with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit draws you unto Him. That in and of itself is a miracle because we're at battle with God in our natural state. We forget God's blessings. We forget God's power. We forget God's answer to prayers. We forget all of that. And when God has to compete with everything else in your life just to get a minute of your attention, how fair is that to God? You see how it is possible to get into that shape spiritually? Well, a contest is executed. Don't worry, the sermon's only going to last another hour. Hang on. Here's the, here is this. Contest is executed. Verse 25 through 38. Here we go. Elijah said, verse 25. Elijah said, Unto the prophets of Baal, choose you one bullet for yourselves, dress it, dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. They took the bullet which, he, which was given them, they dressed it. In other words, they chopped it all up, ready to sacrifice <clears throat> called the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us! But there was no voice nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon, wait, <laughs> you're going to see a little prophetic uh, trash talking right now. Here we go, ready? Here's what's going to happen. Here it happens, ready? Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is in a journey. Or maybe he's asleep and he's got to be woken up. Man, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? <laughs> oh, this is fun. I love this part. That is my favorite part. So they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was passed, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Elijah said unto all people, Come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he, listen, oh boy, underline this. You ready? Look, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Friends, you've got to get it right with God before God's going to move. And there may be some broken altars in your life that need to be repaired 
to Almighty God. Boy, oh, I preached a whole message on that. Don't have time for that. Boy, look, dig into that. Dig into that. And Elijah, listen. Oh, some more. Here we go. Look at this. Took 12 stones according to the, uh, to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as contained two measures of seed. He put the wood in order, cut the bullock in pieces. Uh, and he laid him on the wood and said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Stop right there. This is not the way to effectively start a fire. <laughs> right? Yeah, we ain't starting a fire today, boys. Why did he do that? I want to tell you why he did that. Because he wanted to make sure there was absolutely no doubt in their minds who it was. Oh, let's keep reading. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yeah, where'd I go? Where'd I stop? Oh, my gosh. Uh... Am I? What? 34. And he said, do it the second time. Okay, again, not, not exactly the right way, all right? He said, do it a third time, and they did it a third time. By the way, this is a whole lot of water a lot of people would rather be drinking in the middle of a drought. Right. Just thought I'd let you know that. And the water ran about the altar and filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, what is he doing? He is reminding Israel where they came from. Everything you saw here was saying, Israel, look where you came from. You hear me? All right, here we go. Uh, what did I say? Oh, uh, thou art God of Israel, and, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Notice he obeyed God. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, uh, that this people may know that Thou art the Lord God, and that Thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Stop right there. So now it's executed. So here we go. There's the problems of the false prophets. Prophets of Baal get to go first. Their ministry was trouble. Why was it trouble? Because from early morning till noontime, they couldn't get nothing done. Which was exactly what was going to take place anyway. And then their mockery. Elijah, said, <laughs> Elijah was, uh, he reminded them how foolish and futile this was. He was doing some holy trash talking. Amen? And I want to tell you, Elijah is pretty rough on them boys, but they, but, but they deserve pity. And I believe the world around us does too. The world around us is so foolish that they waste their entire lives living for things that are going to die with them. They spend their entire lives building a dream only to have it end in a nightmare. Amen. God help us to know that the Lord loves them and that we need to reach out to them in love and compassion and try to make a difference in their lives for the glory of God. People, people are foolish. Every now and then on the ship you'd run into a rude person but then you have to stop and think, you know, they just don't know any better. Right? And you kind of want to throw them overboard and teach them a lesson. But other than that, right? They still don't know any better. Love them. But then we see their misery. These guys go into a fit. They cut themselves. And they're jumping. They're dancing. They're prophesying. Can you imagine the scene? 850 of these, of these prophets, right? Jumping around. Cutting themselves. Blood flowing everywhere, right? Doing all this around, right? And nothing. Okay? And that's all of us who live our lives in a frenzy to acquire and do more than our neighbor. Only to die with nothing. Amen? What a terrible way to live. You know, what a terrible way to die. Amen? Well, i got to hurry because I, I just do. All right, here we go. The power of the faithful prophet. We see the preparations. He did that. Uh, and several things stand out. Listen, he called the people to come near. True faith, unlike false worship, has absolutely nothing to hide. Amen? Amen? They have nothing to hide. 
But Elijah rebuilt an old altar that had fallen down. As a matter of fact, uh, he used 12 stones to speak of the 12 tribes. And the people of Israel had constructed altars to Baal. And their altars to Jehovah had become in disrepair. Next, he slaughtered and presented a sin offering. A bull was used for the sin offering. And Elijah knew where the real problem, though, was. <laughs> Friends, if we're saved, the sin offering has already been presented uh, for you to be cleansed. Mm -hmm. Right with me? It's already been presented. However, what God wants from you is a sacrifice of repentance and confession. Amen? 1 John 1, 9. He wants us to confess. He, he, in other words, uh, when we're saved, that's kind of an in and out, all over, up, up and down bath. But I want to tell you, the world, when you go through the world, you kind of you got all this stuff on you, right? He wants you to have that sin of confession and repentance. He wants you to keep clean. He wants you to keep that sin account zero. Well, then he watered down the entire business. He ordered it all down. He wanted there to be no doubt. And there was no doubt. When the goal in your life is to make God first, when the goal in your life is to make is to have God show through you in such a way that people have no doubt of who He is, He will. And then there is the prayer, 63 word prayer, A, B, and C. You ready? The 63 word prayer, He did what? He wanted God to be glorified. First and foremost, He said, God be glorified in all this. Number next, B. That the prophet be vindicated. In other words, that the prophet, what he said was going to happen, happened. In other words, Lord, I, I've spoken as you've said. Now, you know, right? And next is the people be revived. That's a heck of a way to start a revival meeting. Amen? But then there was the proof. Verse 38, Elijah finished praying. And what happened, happened. Fire came down, listen, from above. I want you to note that it came from above, not from underneath. Amen? And we must never underestimate the power of a totally dedicated life. Amen? Well, the crisis has ended. Verses 39 and 40, Roman number 3, the crisis ended. Letter A there, there is the repentance of the people, the wayward people. They fell on their faces and that showed their conviction, number one. That showed their conviction. Number two, they voiced the truth that they have known in their hearts all the time that God is God. He is Lord. He is God. In other words, their confession. So not only did they have a conviction, but that conviction led to a confession. I wish I had more time for this, but I don't. But let her be there. There is the removal of the wicked prophets. Let's look at verse 40 and see how this all ends. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. Yeah. As we examine these, our lives this morning, are there areas we've allowed to become soft spiritually? Maybe we've allowed our lives to become so soft spiritually that we've even decided to challenge God. God, are you really who you say you are? Are you really the one? It is how we are. Are you saved today, but you, but you haven't been living it? You need to get that right today. But here's another thing. Ready? What would it be like to live a life and then to die? And have nothing. And as your family is looking at you there in that casket, and they look, they say, I wonder if he went to heaven or hell. Well, the only thing that's going to tell them is if you've ever given a testimony and told somebody that you've accepted Christ as Savior, that he touched your heart. You repented of your sin. You accepted and you were born again. If you don't have that testimony today, Unfortunately, the only thing you have to look forward to is hell. That's it. Please don't go there.